okay, these children are quietly dismissed. You know, we're going to start in Luke 6, and I didn't even give you that scripture, but we're going to go to Luke 6, verse 46. Yeah, I didn't see your hand, though. Sorry. Yeah, you got your house back. That's nice. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Luke chapter 6. This is just to tie it in. We're, we're kind of continuing this morning's service. Ever since we started Hezekiah, we've been talking about building our lives on the rock. And every time you walk in love, every time you show kindness, every time you're polite and considerate, you're actually building a life according to Jesus. So we're going to look at Luke 6, 46 to start out. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you who he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when the flood occurred, the torrent built burst against the house and could not shake it because it had been well built. Now how did he say it got to be well built? Verse 47, if you come to him and hear his words. Well, let's back up, same chapter. If you got your Bible in the same chapter, go back to verse 27. Look at what his words are. We think, I think that the reason I want to tie this in is I think a lot of times we think, well, the Ten Commandments, and that's right, you don't lie, you don't murder, all those things. But Jesus said a much higher standard. The sayings of Jesus are higher than just don't commit adultery or don't murder. Are you following me here? Look at what he says. He said, but I say to you who here love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. You know what it means? It means to be actively in favor of every single person you meet, to be willing their well-being, willing their salvation. Are you following? Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other. Whoever takes away your coat, don't withhold your shirt either. Give to everyone who asks. Don't take away, or whoever takes away what is yours, don't demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. Now, how many of you know that that is easier to memorize than it is to do? Amen. It's not hard to commit that to memory at all. Do unto others exactly the way you want them to do unto you. But it's like we spoke, and you can go to Romans 8 now, we'll start tonight's message. It's like we said this morning, everybody knows exactly the temperature they'd like the temperature to be within two degrees. And you know, if that's the way it is, right? We know that we would like everybody to smile, and if we mess up, we'd like them to act like they didn't notice. <laughs> you know, we know how. Okay. Now, the other reason that we're studying the love of God is this. If you don't become aware of his love, it doesn't even seem real. We live in such a harsh, critical, catty world. I mean, I love Fox News. Everybody's huge his own. But even on Fox News, it's just, everybody's, you're criticizing somebody all the time. Mm -hmm. And we live in a world where we can't imagine a life without derogatory remarks and cynicism and criticism, okay? I, when, I was in, when I was in Florida, my parents, um, you know, I was visiting them most of the time. But they live, they're in a rehab in Winter Haven, and two hours away, Keith Moore was having in Sarasota. He has two churches, one in Brass, one in Sarasota. And all that week, they were having their greater life, or greater faith campaign, excuse me. And so I only made it one night. It was two hours each way. But it was worth going, okay? I my, got uh, my parents' blessing and just drove over there, and it was such a treat. And he preached... A message I would never have expected a faith preacher to preach. And he took you through Hebrews 11 and showed you how many of the promises we don't receive until the next life. Wow. And this is what he taught on. And when he got to the to the bottom line, I was cheering. I couldn't believe a faith preacher. You know, Brother Copeland was there just to attend. It was a great, exciting meeting. This is what he said. He said, if you don't love the next life more than you love this life, you won't walk in love, you won't walk in faith, and you won't complete your destiny. I'm going to say that again. If you don't love the life to come more than you love this life, you will turn selfish. You will turn fearful. Your faith won't work. And you won't walk in love. You know why? Because this life is about this long. Now, maybe if you're 14, you don't know that yet. If you're over 40, you know this life is not very long. What you're going to I know, 
some of you are sitting on the fence here. You know what, what Moses wrote in Psalm 90? In Psalm 90, Moses said, So teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. It is impossible to stand before the throne of God presenting him your heart of wisdom unless you know that your life down here is very, very brief. And what Keith Moore said is this, Unless you understand that all of this life is... The brevity of this life is lived in the light of eternity, that eternal life. Unless you're more aware of that realm, more loving that, the reward, a lot of our rewards, I guarantee you a lot of Bill Karen's rewards are going to come in the next row. You understand? We appreciate them, but you wait till you find out how God. I'm using them as an example. Every one of us, what we're doing, we're not, if we're going to run this race and walk in love on the level that God wants us to walk in love, we will have to be far more aware of the eternal spiritual realm than we are of this realm. Because if you get in this realm, you get in a grump. You see, you don't have scripture for that. What about Romans 8? It says, the mind set upon the flesh is death. The mind set upon the spirit is life and peace. I think it's Romans 8, 6, but I'm not sure. It's a verse or two. But there. If you get your mind completely on this world, you're going to be grumpy to live with. You know why? Because we were never meant for this world. We were meant for the love of God. And the way you get your mind on the love of God is to be aware of spiritual things. So we're gonna, that is why, that's a long introduction, longer than I like, but that's why we're studying the love of God. You have to be aware of it to give it. Yeah. Look at Romans 8.33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. So is God the accuser of the brother the way the devil says he is? Everybody say that. God is not the accuser of the brethren. God is not. If you got a voice going in your head beating on you, that is not God. Who is he? Everybody say, he's my justifier. He's my justifier. Isn't that precious? Verse 34, who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who, has, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. What is Jesus' role? Jesus' role is to die for us and to intercede for us. Now, are you feeling the love yet? You have to think about this. You don't just get up in the morning and look at the sunrise and try to feel the love of God. It's okay to have that. I like to have coffee, get with God. But you find out who he is and you start thanking him, you'll know his love. Verse 35. Just as it is, or excuse me, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or peril, or sore just as it is written. For your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us, or could be because of him who loved us. Why do we overwhelmingly conquer? Because if he loves us, it doesn't matter if the whole world is against you. You can have every Christian on earth sign a petition to say, we don't want them in heaven. Now, they're not going to do it, but suppose. Do you know what God would do? He'd laugh. Right. You can have every army come against you. And if God's on, we, we don't have enough respect for who our dad is. Right. If our dad loves us, we're good. Look at 38. Paul said, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I want to tell you tonight that you can have the perfect life and own the biggest mansion, and without the love of God, there would be something missing. You can have a $45 million mansion on the water, and you don't have the love of God, something would be missing. You couldn't put your finger on it, you might not know what it was. And I have also heard of people in solitary confinement found God. And said I was, there was an, a, a lady that lived many years ago, I think the 1500s, Madame Joan Peel, and my French is terrible. But, and I, I don't agree with everything she ever wrote, but she was a French high society lady, a beautiful, beautiful woman who moved in the high society in Paris, and she came down with smallpox, and it disfigured her terribly. And in the rejection in this artificial society where looks were everything, you realize that's artificial. But people rejected her because of her disfigurement. And in that disfigurement, she saw God and found him. She was Catholic, but she began to write things. And she finally got herself kicked out of the Catholic Church because she was calling them to the true Savior. I'm not against the Catholic Church. That can happen in any church. But anyhow, because of her writings, the priests got so upset with her, they had her thrown in a dungeon. 
And she later wrote, she said, I had peace and joy and fulfillment in the dungeon that I never knew in the high society of France. Wow. You know why? Because you were created. I'm not hoping a dungeon on you, but that you were created for the love of God. We were created because of the love of God. He longed for someone on his level that he could love and fellowship with. And he said, oh, are you trying to say we're God's? No, but we're the closest thing to a genuine friend God has ever had. We were made in his image. We were created because of the love of God, and we were born of his love, created in his image. And that means that you ought to be able to love exactly the way Jesus Christ loves. High bar, we go to 1 Peter 1. And the moment we say these things, we say, well, what's in this for me? An indestructible life. An indestructible life. You walk in the love of God the way Jesus did, and there's no devil in hell that can touch you. 1 Peter 1.22. Peter writes, since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls. What does that mean, purified your soul? Got all the jealousy out get all the criticism out. Have you ever had been a place in your life where all you could see was what was wrong with everybody? Boy, is that a miserable place. He said, you've purified your souls. How do you purify your soul? With the Word of God. You let the Word of God wash out that junk. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purify your souls. Why? Why would you want to purify your souls? For sincere love and brother. Where you can just, that word sincere... It means unhypocritical. It means without wax in the Greek. And what that means is they would take marble. Real marble didn't have any wax in it. It was pure. They made the statue. But if they had marble and it was cheaper and they wanted, they'd put wax on it. It was called, it's sin seri. Sin means without the Spanish and seri is wax. It means without wax. It means unhypocritical. That means that when you love somebody and you say, I am going to pray for you, you really pray. You really love them. You know, you're not just smiling and giving an empty compliment. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purify your souls for sincere love of the brethren. Fervently love one another from the heart. Do you know that when you're really loving your brothers and sisters, there's joy? When you don't care less about them, there's apathy. And there's, you know, so what? You can't love people without there being joy. If you really love the saints, you come together on Sunday morning. It's such a joy. Oh, we haven't seen each other in three days. This is cool. <laughs> fervently. Everybody say fervently. fervently. Love one another from the heart. Now, why are you going to be able to do that? For you have been born again. You are no longer a child of the devil that thinks about himself or herself all the time. Children of the devil care about themselves because the devil's taught them that way. All right? That's what the Bible says. For you have been born again, not of seed. Some versions say sperm. It's a divine spiritual sperm. Not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. So you were created because of love, the love of God, and you were created by the love of God. His, when the word of God came into your spirit and you accepted it, you were literally born of his DNA. Amen. And when you say, I just can't love people with a self-sacrificial love, that's a lie. You may have chosen not to, but the, that very love has been, you've been born of that love, and that love has been shed abroad in your heart. That's exciting. Yeah. Romans 5 eight says that the love of God is demonstrable. Almost every New Testament writer refers to the love of God constantly. He says, God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I understand some people say, well, that's old news. It's not old news. It's eternal news. Yeah. It's a news that we will celebrate in heaven. And when you get up in the morning and say, well, I just don't feel the love of God. Doesn't matter. You go to the truth and you say, I thank you. The jerk that I was, you, you counted me worth your blood. Thank you. Okay? You cannot believe the cross and question the love of God. Now go to 2 Corinthians 5, 13 to 14. We're going to read a few more scriptures. Now I'm going to read you a story. One of my, I love the Old Testament. And I think the reason we don't preach and teach more of it is because of time constraints in our society. That the, it only takes about 10 minutes. I'm going to read you a story about David. 2 Corinthians 5, 13. David is one of the greatest examples of love in the Old Testament. And everybody knows where he messed up with Bathsheba and Uriah. Okay, everybody knows about that. But if you follow his whole life, the man lived a rock-solid life built on the love of God. And that's why at 70 he was still beloved. He went out of here in style praising God. 
All right, 2 Corinthians 5, 13 to 14. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. What does that mean? Paul's talking about getting people saved. If we're beside ourselves, we go door to door and shake people and say, you've got to get born again. I mean, have you ever felt frantic when people can't see it and they don't care? All right, that if we're beside ourselves, it's for God. If we're of sound mind, it's for you. What does that mean? If we try to be sane and directional, it's so that you can accept it, all right? Why? 14. For the love of Christ controls us. I think the New King James says constrains us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. The, this verse means that the biggest factor in every decision you ever make is the love of God. You all... I can remember once, in, in years and years ago, my husband was still here, and something came up in the church, and it was complex because one person's rights just seemed to overlap the other person's rights. And we said, what would Brother Hagen do? And, and, and Pastor Gordon said, he'd say, what does the love of God say? That's the question you ask yourself all day long. What does the love of God say? That's how you build your house. The love of God controls us or constrains us. It directs our decisions day in and day out. Now look at verse 15. It, do you notice in 14 it says, one died for all, therefore all died? That means that you died to yourself. You died to what you wanted on this earth. Why would I want to do that? Because the purposes of eternity are so important. All right, you didn't like that, but he died to himself to live for you. And you died to yourself to live for him. Let's read the two verses, verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. We died. And he died for all that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Now, I told you two things. I said, you died so that we, you could live for him. But he died so that he could live for you. Now, and you say, and I know most people don't know that. We're going to go through five worlds fast, and there's many others. I didn't even put shepherd in here. Do you know that Jesus lives for you right now? Everybody knows he died for them, but it's just so that he's living for you. Go to Hebrews 7.24. This is important. I got so happy writing this. You know, if we're not happy in the love of God, it's just our own stupid fault. Laziness and ignorance. I'm sorry, but you say, how do you know? Because I've been there and done that. You just get dull about spiritual things. You think, well, what has God done for me lately? You know, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. And then you, you know why he gave this the word? So we know. Hebrews 7, 24 and 25. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I find no greater proof of someone's love than that they pray for me. Prayer is a selfless act, and it's usually known only to God. When I called my mom today, I could tell she had company in the room. So I said, I just wanted to tell you, Christiana was sick yesterday. Please pray. It turned out she had a whole room full of people from her church. I visited their church when I, when I was down there. It was a little old-fashioned, but they're sincere. They love God. I don't care if, what's, what, if it's old-fashioned as long as they're genuine. And they're genuine. Mom, I called her later and said I got a, te or a text message. She's much better. And she said, we all gathered around, and they, they insisted on praying right then. And they prayed. Now, do you know what motivated that? Nothing but the love of God. They got nothing out of it but knowing that they blessed. There is, now listen, I love it when people pray, but what about when Jesus prays? That's, that's not just a cute saying. At this moment, he's praying for you to go the distance and get your whole reward. Whoa. So first of all, we see that he's our intercessor. Look at, let's just read these on the board because I'm going to read you that story about Abigail and David. First John 2, 1. Look at this. He's our advocate. John wrote about this. He said, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, oh my. Does he acknowledge the fact that somebody can mess up and sin? What's going to happen? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So he's your intercessor and he's your counsel for the defense. He's your advocate. When you need to go to the Father who is perfectly holy, you don't go alone. Oh, you ought to be getting happy. I'm happy whether you are or not. 
We have somebody who loves us. Day and night and night and day. Hallelujah. 1 Timothy 2, 5 to 6, he's our mediator. For there is one God and one mediator also between man, God and man, the man Christ Jesus. I love it so much. He's a man and he, he chose to stay a man. There's days I'd rather not be a human being. Human beings are so nasty. But he's not ashamed to be one of us. Isn't that good? So he is our intercessor, our advocate, and our mediator. Let me ask you something. Does he live for you at this moment? Yes. Yeah, he died for you. He died so he could live for you, and you died so you could live for him. We exchange lives. Look at Hebrews 2. He's your sanctifier. Now, the problem with sanctifier is that it's a religious term. And the word sanctifier simply means to set apart for you, someone's use. So, okay, this is an example. If you sanctify this glass for me, it means it's not in the kitchen for everybody to use. It's set apart for me. Wait. I, it's just, it, that's what the word sanctify. If you have gold vessels in the temple and they've been sanctified as holy to the Lord, you don't use those to wash your clothes in. Are you following me? But when you first come to Jesus, you aren't holy enough to be used. And do you know what he does? He takes you, he works with you, and he sets you apart and makes you holy. So you, look at it. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons of Lord to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Next verse. For both he who sanctifies, and those who are being sanctified, it says literally, are all from the Father. For which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren. So what that means is he's our elder brother and he is the sanctifier. He's the one who takes us where we're less than ready for service. And he makes us holy where we can be. Isn't that wonderful? So he is our intercessor, our advocate, our mediator, our sanctifier. And finally, there's many other roles we're going to look at. He's our great high priest. Hebrews 4, 14 to 15. You know, we have reason to worship him. Amen. Hebrews 4.14 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who is tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. What does the high priest do? He goes before the Father on our behalf when we've messed up. So then, now there's, a better, there's another verse I like even better. Go to 9.11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. What is it talking about? When Moses built the tabernacle in the wilderness, he built a reflection of what he had seen in heaven. When he was on the mountain, God just took him up to heaven and let him see the one in heaven and said, okay, then build one on earth. The temple that Solomon built was a reflection of the one in heaven. Are you all following? There is a place of worship in heaven. Let's read this again. It says, when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things to come, he entered through a greater. But a greater than what? Greater than the tabernacle here on earth. A more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this creation. He's our high priest in that unseen realm. And then look what he brought. Not the blood of goats and calves. Not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. If this doesn't mean something to you, you just got to think of what, it, what if you hadn't done it. He is a high priest who shed his own blood for you, gathered it up. Remember when he was coming up out of the grave, he saw Mary and said, go tell my brethren I'm alive. And he said, don't touch me. You know why he said, don't touch me? I've not yet ascended to the Father. He had not taken his blood into the holy place yet. Don't touch me yet. When he came back, you know, he said, touch me. John chapter 20, he said, touch me. But before that, he said, I haven't yet ascended. This is what he did for you. It was the holiest thing that's ever been done. He went not through the blood of goats and cows, but through his own blood. And he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So he's your sanctifier, and your, whole, your high priest. He's, he's the one who stands before God on your behalf, and you never, you've never been afraid to go to God, There's things won't just quite exactly right. Um, you haven't, I have And he says, well, you don't go alone. Alone, he said, I'm your mediator, an advocate, sanctifier, and your high priest. I'm the one who going to see. Uh, we, we should love him for that. We should pray. You want to read one story really fast? Not really, huh? Go to 1 Samuel. This is a great change of pace. 
My point in all this is you have to stir up yourself for why you love God and you have to worship and tell him, Jesus, I appreciate you. I appreciate your patience with me. David built a life. Well, it's 1 Samuel chapter 25. David built a life on the love of God. If you look, the day he built, brought the ark in, Remember how he was dancing before the ark? Afterwards, he had this massive food giveaway where he gave loaves and raisins to everybody. We said, well, that's no big deal. That's, do you know what their gross domestic product was? It was all agrarian. It took all their effort to feed themselves. For him to give away that much food was very, very generous. Another time, they were fighting the Philistines close to Bethlehem. And you know, he grew up in Bethlehem. He had a taste for the water. He said, ooh, I wish I could go get a drink out of that well. So if you know the story, three of his generals, his mighty men, said, well, if the king wants a drink of water, we get him a drink of water. So what they do, at the risk of their lives, they fought their way through enemy lives, lines, remember this? Yeah. Gathered some water, fought their way back, and said, here, king, we want you to have the drink of the water you wanted. And David said, that is way, way precious, too precious to drink. Do you know what he did? He took it off, and he offered it to the Lord. He said, why would somebody do that if they... Because it was holy. Amen. He said, these men have gone at the... Do you know how few kings ever appreciated their men that much? Now, I'm talking about a man, and we all know Bathsheba and Uriah, but take that chunk out, that little sliver where he messed up, and you look at the scope of his life. You go to Israel today. I've been there. They respect and revere Moses. They adore David. David was awesome. But David almost messed up, and we better start reading quick, okay? Verse 5, or, or 25, verse 1, Samuel died. Israel mourned for him. David arose and went to the wilderness. He's running for his life. Saul is out to kill him. Verse 2. Now there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich. And he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And it came about while he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the man's name was Nabal. His wife's name was Abigail. The woman was intelligent and beautiful in appearance. But the man was harsh and evil in his dealings, and he was a Calebite. What do you mean to be a Calebite? He descended from Caleb. Caleb was a good man. He wasn't. Verse 4. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. You have to understand that it was customary when you had a sheep shearing. The head guy got a lot of money for the wall, and he was had a, So everybody had good on him. Okay, He had a feast for his people, right? Now, okay. Let me explain. Give me t two minutes. David is in the wilderness with 600 men. They've been, they had to be somewhere, right, hiding from Saul. And so while they were close to this guy, it says later in that they have been a wall to him. Nobody could poach from their sheep, and wolves couldn't get. They were good to this guy, all right? So David thinks, oh, sheep sharing time. We ought to share in that. We've been good to these people. Verse 5. So David sent to yet 10 young men. And David said to the young men, go up to Carmel and visit Nabal and greet him in my name. And, and thus you shall say, have a long life, peace to you, peace to your house, peace to all that you have. Now I've heard that you have shears, and now your shepherds have been with us, and we have not insulted them, nor have they missed anything all the days they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we have come on a festive day. Please give whatever you find at hand to your servants and your son David. So he's saying, hey, I hear you have a party, we've been good to you, could we just join the party? You know, they're out in the midst of the wilderness. Seems like a reasonable request to David. When David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all these words in David's name, and they waited. But Nabal, Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who's David? Who's the son of Jesse? There's many servants today breaking away from his master. In other words, I know you think you're going to be king. Everybody wants to be king. Shall I then, verse 11, take my bread and my water and my meat that I slaughtered for my shears and give it to men whose origin I do not know? So David's young men retraced their way and went back, and they came and told according to all these words. Now, normally, David's not a hothead, but he's been traipsing around. If you go ahead a few chapters, this is just very shortly before he becomes king. If you go, you know the devil can get to you and wear you down to where you're not yourself? Well, look at verse 13. David said to his men, each of you gird on, gird on your sword. So each man girded on his sword, and David also girded on his sword. And about 400 men went up with David, while 200 stayed with the baggage. 
But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he scorned them. And yet the men were very good to us, and we were not insulted, nor did we miss anything as long as we went about with them while we were in the fields. They were a wall to us, both by day and night, all the time we were there with them, tending the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what you should do, for evil is plotted against our master and against all his household. And he is such a worthless man, nobody can speak to him. I want to tell you one thing right now. Don't ever fall in that category. Because as wise as you are at some point, as wise as you are at some point, you're going to need somebody to speak a word of correction. David's salvation here is that he listens to correction. Let's keep reading. I love this story because look how much love Abigail shows. Then Abigail hurried and took 200 loaves of bread. Okay, what's that for? To, to make up for what the other guy, what her husband didn't give. Two jugs of wine, five sheep already prepared, five measures of roasted grain and 100 clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and loaded them on donkeys. And she said to her young men, go on before me. Behold, I'm coming after you. But she didn't tell Nabal. Why? Because he would have Wow. It came about as she was riding on her donkey and coming down by the hidden part of the mountain that behold, David and his men were coming down toward her, and so she met them. Now, David, I mean, this guy is hot mad. Now, can I tell you, I have, I have somebody I call, a friend I call when I get so mad, I know I'm unreasonable. I'm sure you don't. Is there anybody <laughs> else here who is ever unreasonably mad? Have you ever found yourself, it's, is it a time when your flesh is just, for some reason, the devil has pushed the right buttons? You better know this, I'm telling you. When I, usually if I get mad and I'm getting prayer, then it's over and that's it. And if I am not getting over it, I know there's either something that needs to be addressed in the spirit where I need to pray, or I am not looking at it straight. And I have a friend I go to and I say, I'm not proud of this, but I'm so mad, I am spitting nails and I, two days! I don't know I go that long. You're not supposed to be spitting mad two days. Amen. Well, David's out of control here. Talking to himself, verse 21, now David said, Surely in vain I have guarded all this man has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him, and he has returned evil for good. Now he did return evil for good, but it wasn't worth killing him. Or killing anybody there. Are you following? May God do so to the enemies of David more also if by morning I leave as much as one male that belongs to him. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and dismounted from her donkey and fell on her face before David and bowed herself to the ground. And she fell at his feet, and she said, On me alone, O Lord, be the blame. What did she do wrong? Absolutely nothing. Do you know what love does in the middle of an argument where you know the argument? It just says, well, I was wrong. It's wrong. Oh, you know, I knew they got was over really good. She takes twice all the blame of Nabal's idiocy and David's unreasonableness to stop a fight. And she saves all their servants' lives. He was going to kill every male servant. There will come a time in your life when you just say, well, I was the one that was wrong. Do you know that love is willing to say, okay, I was wrong? Because love isn't proud. Love just wants to stop the fight. Now, I'm not asking you to be a doormat. There's a, there's a balance. When Abigail saw David, she heard him as dismounted from her donkey. She fell on her face before David and bowed herself to the ground. And she fell at his feet and said, on me alone, O Lord, be the blame. Please, let your maidservant speak to you and listen to the words of your maidservant. Please, do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man, Nabal, for as is his name, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young man whom my Lord sent. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood, and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be as Nabal. He said, I've just stopped you from killing people you shouldn't kill. Now here's what happens. Every single one of us is going to have a time in our lives when we need somebody to say, you're wrong. I have friends who will tell me, no, you're wrong on this one. I, I knew you would love this. I'll sit down, y'all can think just in good man. But do you know what? If he had gone into this, as far as I know, Uriah was the only person he ever killed unjustly. And that wasn't good. It cost him a lot. Well, what if he'd gone in and killed a couple hundred guys working for this guy just because he was mad? How unrighteous is that? Mm -hmm. 
And I love, his, I love the way he responds. In for verse 26, she said, I've just restrained you from kill, shedding innocent blood. Verse 27, now let this gift which your maidservant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who accompany my Lord. And please forgive the transgression of your maidservant. And I just ask you, can you be humble enough to say, look, I'm really sorry. It wasn't worth the fight. Do you know that 98% of the fights you fight in a married couple aren't worth a hill of beans? It's just about wanting to be right. <laughs> I'll say that 21 times. 98% of the fights a married couple fight are not worth the hill of beans. It's just wanting to be right. You say, how do you know? Because I was married. And I wasn't married well for a while. Because I had... Please forgive the transgression of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because the Lord is fighting. Is she coming down on the side of truth here? Yeah, because the Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and evil will not be found in you all your days. Should anyone rise up to pursue you and seek your life, then the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. She said, you are so tight with God and your righteousness that whoever comes after you, they've not been able to find you. But for goodness sakes, don't get out from under the covering and kill innocent blood. Isn't this wisdom? I love this. There's so much love in this chapter. That middle of 929, then the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God, but the lives of your enemies he will sling out as from the hollow of the sling. And when the Lord does for my Lord, according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you, and appoints you ruler over Israel, this will not be a grief or a troubled heart to my Lord, both by having shed blood without cause and by my Lord having avenged himself. She said, you're doing two things really wrong. You're shedding blood, innocent blood, and you're avenging yourself, and the Lord said that he is the one who avenges. Yes. When the Lord deals well with you, remember your maidservant. She asked for a little favor there at the end. So when she gets it, she marries him. Yeah. <laughs> then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. I say, what's so surprising about that? Everything. Yeah. Everything. For women who are raised in this society, you have to go to the Middle East to even begin to understand today. Today, the way, and I don't know if it's as bad in the Jewish as it is in the Arabs, but I'm just telling you, women are treated like property. A man never had to listen to a woman. Do you understand? Now, this is super important. How many of you want to build a, a lifelong house of love where the devil cannot even find a way in because you treat God with love and you treat people with love, all right? Then if you're going to build this storm-worthy, hurricane category 5-worthy house, it is going to take some correction from somebody somewhere along the line. And we don't want to think it was, but at some point you'll have a blind spot. And you're going to need somebody to speak into your life. And when they do, you can either give them the back of your hand and say, who do you think you are? I'm going to kill them. Or you can say, thank God you stopped me. David's humility saved him that day. Can you see that? They don't, women did not go around correcting men in this society. And yet, I'm not trying to be a woman's liberator here. I'm just saying the humility of David. Look at what he says. Verse 32, Then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you to me this day, and blessed be your discernment, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. Don't you love it when somebody can just say, Man, was I wrong? Do you know that if you're going to be a, a love walker, one who walks in love, there's going to be times to say, I was totally out of line, even to your own kids. I've said that to my own kids, but I was just in the flesh for a moment. I'm sorry. But you know what? They don't hate you for it. They knew it before you told them. <laughs> How many, I just want this so, I just want this house so built on the love of God that the devil can't touch it. That's what David ends up with. Nevertheless, as the Lord of God of Israel is, who restrained me from harming you, we're in verse 34, unless you had come quickly to meet me, surely there would not have been left in Nabal until the morning light as much as one male. So David received from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, Go up to your house in peace. See, I have listened to you and granted your request. Then Abigail came up. Do you want to read the rest of it? Nabal has either a stroke or a heart attack and dies. You know, the Lord will always avenge you. I just want to tell you something. Do not worry about, if you've got somebody who's acting out of love and you're acting in love, you will get defended every time. It may take a little time, but the love of God defends people. Then Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk, so she did not tell him anything at all until morning light. But in the morning, when the light had gone out of Nabal, 
His wife told him these things, and his heart died within him. I don't know if it's a heart attack or a stroke, so that he became like a stone. And about ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord, who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and has kept back his servant from evil. The Lord has also returned the evil doing of Nabal on his own hand. And then David sent a proposal to Abigail to take her as his wife, and she becomes his wife. And I love that story because we live in a society that likes to be right all the time. How many, how many of you like to be right? Come on, yeah, come on. Oh, come on. We all like to be right. No. But you know you're going to be wrong sometimes. And if you insist on going down that path, even when people you love and respect are speaking into your life, it can be really, really painful. But when you have people... I, I don't think you should let everybody speak into your life, all right? That's crazy. That's a recipe for woo. <laughs> I mean, you understand? You'll get 35 pieces of advice and they're conflicting. But you ought to have a couple of people that you know know God. And you can go to them and just say, am I thinking straight on this? And talk it out with them. I hope I've helped you. Yeah. What I'm trying to help you see is that your goal above every goal. And I, could, I would love to read the whole Old Testament in the light of this love thing. You go to Hezekiah's life, anybody finish reading his life? He starts out in love, he turns the nation around, he gets the big miracle, and in chapter 38 and 9 or, of um, Isaiah, he messes up. You know what he does? That He gets a letter from the king of Babylon that says, we heard you were sick, because he gets real sick and he gets a miracle and God adds 15 years to his life. Remember Hezekiah? We heard you were sick. We're so glad you're better. And he's a bit flattered and it pleased him. He said, well, you was flattered. Don't ever, ever care what people think about you. Because if you do, the devil will use that to pull you out of the will of God. Why? Because he's got people whose strengths he can pull. Do you know what the guy did? He said, well, come on over for a visit. He took them in and showed them all the temple treasures. Everything. Isaiah was troubled. He went and said, what did you show them? He said, absolutely everything. He said, I want you to know that because of your falling and doing this, some of your descendants will be servants of the king of that one's um, household. He will come and destroy you. Now, this is what is so sad. Isaiah said, but it won't happen in your time. Hezekiah thought, well, that's a good word. That's what he told him. He said, that's a good, you know why he thought it was a good word? Because it wouldn't have more yet. You see it, your mom. And what does that say? You can act against love, against generations to come. The point, I know I got to sit down, I'm almost done. Here we go. <laughs> the point of this church is not just to love us, but to love your kids. So that when, are you following me? How many young people haven't had your kids yet? I want to love your kids before they get here so that when this, this church is in such shape when they get here, they'll think it's the coolest thing on earth. This church has blessed my daughter. Easy. I got it through the teens without any problem because serving God is cool. Thanks to are we are you following this? The real love of God doesn't just love your generation; it loves generations to come. And when you are consumed with that love, God will do anything for you. Hallelujah. Let's sing something. If you got something, Bill. Hallelujah.